välkomna till Classic Le Mans 2010. Viel Spaß und herzliche Grüße aus Le Mans. Welcome to the Classic Le Mans. Uh, wir sind hier bei Le Mans Classic. Bienvenidos a Le Mans Classic. Hallo, Sala, Le Mans Classic. Welcome to one of motor racing's most hallowed grounds, home to the most significant motor race in the world. A circuit that every other year since 2002 has been a source of wonderment and rapture. This is the Le Mans Classic, a must-do event for collectors and those with a special passion for vintage automobiles. There are two ways of being part of the show, either own a car that participated in the Le Mans 24 hours up to 1979, or enter an identical model, or immerse yourself in the unique atmosphere. En termes de participants, ça bouge pas beaucoup parce que we have roughly the same number of entrants and this is the fifth edition. We reached our capacity in each of the past two events. There will be 408 competitors and 60 reserve cars, bringing the total number of cars in competition to 468. However, car club participation has grown with more than 7,000 cars on display. We've seen an increase in our other attractions. There's the car auction as well. Citroën will introduce its new concept car. There's the Le Mans Heritage Concours and we have many other attractions too. And the weekend festivities got underway on Thursday evening with a gala event at the Epo Abbey. Built in the 12th century, this is an ideal setting to begin the celebration of automobiles created in the 20th century. But while nostalgia is a driving force in the Le Mans Classic, attention is also paid to the automobiles of today and tomorrow. The public gates opened early on Friday, July the 9th, and the paddock area is already abuzz with activity under sunny skies. High temperatures too, and a very retro aroma in the air. For all in attendance on this weekend, the Le Mans Classic is the centre of the motoring universe. There's no event like it anywhere else in the world. The atmosphere was just as exciting in the Art Curial tent, where there were some prospective buyers of one extraordinary vehicle. The star of this car auction is the César decorated McLaren F1 GTR, a rolling masterpiece if ever there was one. It raced at Le Mans in 1995. One of its drivers was Hervé Poulin, and 15 years later, the well-known auctioneer no longer holds a steering wheel, but a gavel, as he oversees the sale. C'est le clou parce que c'est une sorte de joconde de l'automobile pour ces années. It's the star of the show. It was the Mona Lisa of motor racing during its day back in the 1990s. The car was designed by an automotive genius, Gordon Murray, with a BMW engine and built by McLaren, which says a lot about it. There are two stories with the car. The first is its racing resume. It ran at Le Mans and I was behind the wheel. And whether it's modest to say it or not, I admit I was proud to be involved. Secondly, it's joined the pantheon of art cars thanks to the genius of the sculptor César. He incorporated the compressed images of trophies I won at Le Mans into the bodywork. So who would buy such an extraordinary car? Monsieur Poulain has his own opinion as to what kind of person will be the future owner of this gem. We have to find someone who knows how to drive, who's young, and who's a billionaire. One million eight hundred thousand. One million eight hundred thousand. 1.8 million euros for the McLaren and 6.4 million overall. This too is part of the Le Mans Classic aura. Once the scrutineering and administrative process is complete, the competitors head out for their practice sessions. There are six groups based on when a car was built and its participation at Le Mans, with the oldest cars dating back to 1923, the year the first twice around the clock marathon was held. In all, more than 50 years of motor racing history, the Automobile Club d'Ouest has reason to be proud. 
This is the fifth edition and each one is better than the last. We react to the needs of the spectators and their interests and I believe we've done everything we could to ensure everyone enjoys themselves to the fullest. Friday evening was the first chance for the competitors to drive the legendary circuit at night and face the challenges of the Mulsanne Strait. Arnage, Indianapolis and the other world-renowned corners of the French track. Something every driver has dreamed of doing one day. It's 8 a.m. Saturday, July the 10th, and the big day has finally come. The spectators have shown up en masse with nearly 100,000 people in attendance over the weekend. The paddock is abuzz with anticipation, the village is still full of activity, and there's plenty happening on the circuit too with the club and constructor parades. The Le Mans Classic is an authentic automobile production, and because we evoke cinema, know that there's also an autograph session for those famous drivers who had the pleasure of taking part in the shooting of the film Le Mans starring Steve McQueen some 40 years ago. Another of the important elements in this fifth edition is the increased involvement from the more storied constructors. The 40th anniversary of Porsche's first win or the 75th of Jaguar's maiden 24 hours triumph. Other car makers such as BMW, Nissan and Ford organized demonstrations of their respective high-end machines while Citroën marked the occasion with the introduction of its new Survolt model. And the French car maker called upon Vanina Eeks to put in some demonstration runs in the Survolt one month after she took part in this year's 24 Hours of Le Mans. At first, the project was about building an extremely sexy car, very sensual, and to marry this style with a lot of emotion and clearly something very feminine. It has very Citroën-like tendencies with fluidity, combining with important elements such as the electric motors. What you have here is very close to what our future car, the Citroën C0, will be. It will be one of the first cars made available to the public at large. And as motor racing has always helped develop cars in general, we decided to marry this competition with this technology of the future. Well, let's now hear from the lady who has the honor of taking the Servolt out. The sensations are excellent, but it's all new to me. It took me a little time to figure it out, but it handles really well. A little like a cart, in fact. It has smooth acceleration. It doesn't make any noise, and the fact that it's environmentally friendly is very important, in my opinion. What's really nice about the Le Mans Classic is that you get the chance to travel in time. You have the best looking cars from the past, and with this car, you have one of the best looking of the future. Electric solutions really need to be looked into. She says, I feel very comfortable, it was built for me.
with the first official drive on the track for the Sauvault. Who knows, we may be witnessing an authentic moment in automobile history. Three forty-five, Saturday, July the tenth. The moment everyone has been waiting for. A trip back in time to the glory days, and the drivers set off using what was the famous race's signature for decades: the Le Mans start. Group 3 had the honour of kicking off the race. Each group will have three races over the weekend, and this field consists of cars built between 1957 and 1961. There are England's finest with Jaguars, Lotuses and Aston Martins, but Italy was nicely represented with Ferraris, Lancias and Maseratis, and of course Porsche was in the mix with a fine array of 356s. Let's remind ourselves of the regulations. The six different groups have three races, the results are made known at the end of each race and there's an overall classification after the three. But there's more, there's also an overall index, a performance order and a team competition for those entered in all the groups. As you can sense, this is a real 24-hour competition. Some are racing for results. And one driver of note in this category is former Le Mans winner, Jan Lammers in a 1961 Ferrari Dino 246 SP. The number 38 Ferrari 246 of Harry Leventis dominated qualifying and starts from pole position in race one. But it was the duo of Roger Wills and Joe Twyman in their Lotus 15 who went on for the win. They then finished second in race two at night behind the Maserati T61 birdcage of Willie Baltz and Frank Stibler. There was an unusual amount of activity in the pits during race three. It was either because the cars began to suffer in the heatwave-like conditions, or it was the time to make a driver change among those who shared the driving duties. Race 3 was decisive in the overall outcome with the Maserati getting the upper hand in this final battle. 
Quilly Baltz and Frank Stippler took top honours in Group 3 ahead of two Lotus 15s, an Aston Martin DBR GT and the list of cost in Jaguar of Monteverdi, Pearson and Smith. Who amongst us wouldn't want to rediscover his or her childhood innocence? Little Big Mom was created with this in mind, with budding drivers between the ages of 6 and 13 getting their chance to get behind the wheel. They all made their way to the starting grid with either an electric-powered or reduced combustion engine, powering these vintage replicas. Hello, my name is Michael. Welcome to Little Big Man. Salut, c'est Mathilde. Bienvenue au Little Big Man. Et je veux parler de Little Big Man. Deuxième édition. Mathilde, qui c'est qui t'a donné envie de faire de la, de la course Who made you want to go car racing, we asked Mathilde. She said, my dad, every time we talk, he seems very happy. I wanted to share his passion with him. And what's your car? It's the Estelle. I was supposed to be in a Lotus 7, but there was something wrong with it. So I'm in this one and it's very nice. Are you going to do something good in the race? Yeah, but it's not really a race, it's a parade, but we are allowed to overtake. And the icing on the cake, these youngsters were given the chance to set off using the world-famous Le Mans start. Little Big Mom, where memories are made that will last a lifetime, and the spectators seem to have as good a time during the running of the Little Big Mont as the kids. Now to Group 4, featuring cars built between 1962 and 1965. is composed mostly of Ferraris, but the first four GT40s are also present, recreating one of the more legendary battles of the 60s. And there are a few drivers you may have heard of, like Tommy Erdos, Pedro Lamy, Jan Lammers, and of course Jean Ragnotti in a Renault Alpine M65. Former rally standout Luis Perez Comdanc is also on hand in his 1962 Ferrari 330 TRI, a fantastic field in which the win in race one went to the German participant Christian Glazel in the GT40. Glazel also won the night race against three AC Cobras led by Ludovic Caron. 
Jean Ragnotti and teammate Alain Serpaggi finished 11th, while lady driver Claudia Hertken in a Ferrari 275-330 and the Ford GT40 of Hans Hugenholz suffered mechanical problems. Well, would Christian Gladesel be the first driver to win each of his three races? Well, indeed he would. The German driver won for a third time on Sunday, outclassing the rest of the category. Behind the unbeatable GT40 was an AC Cobra, but also a diminutive Lotus Elan that worked its way into the overall top five. Over at the village, more of the cars that wrote important chapters in the 24 hours of Le Mans history books were competing in the Le Mans Heritage Club Concours d'Elegance, and the judges were busy. Plenty of memories to be shared by all, and jury president Jean-Pierre Plouet, who is also Citroën's design director, is well aware of the importance of his role. I'm very proud to have accepted this challenge, he says. This is my first time and it's hardly an easy task, but I'm surrounded by specialists and those who have a great knowledge of automobiles and motor racing. It's both a pleasure and an honour. Even the Automobile Club d'Ouest got in on the act, entering this stunning 1971 Porsche 917, further confirming the importance of the Le Mans Heritage Concours d'Elegance. When the judging was over, the award for best in show went to this 1937 Adler Super Trump, which is currently being restored, but perhaps its raw state was what swung the judges. We'll now turn our attention to Group 5 for cars built between 1966 and 1971. In those days, Ford was the car to beat, but Porsche would soon take over. One car deserving a mention is the second place overall in 1971. The number 42 Porsche 917, driven this weekend by Richard Atwood, winner in 1970, and 1983 champion Vern Schuppan. Other well-known drivers from the past competing included Jean-Claude Androuet in a 1971 Chevron B16, Paul Belmondo in a 72 Corvette, Indianapolis 500 champion Danny Sullivan in the 1968 Alfa Romeo T33 II, French sports car driver Sohail Ayari in a 72 Ferrari 365 GTB 4 Group 4, and René Arnoux in a 1971 Marta 660 who raced regular historic races Sylvain Stepan, Harry Leventis, Gregor Fiskin, Bobby Verdenrow, David Piper, Jean-Marc Luco, Jacques Nicolet, Miguel Amaral and Neil Primrose from the British rock group Travis, he also got in on the act. 
The duo of Jean-Marc Luco and Jacques Nicolet won race one from pole in their Ligier J53. A strong run for Nicolet just a month or so after he finished a credible ninth in the Le Mans 24 hours. Luco and Nicolet were less fortunate in race two, which was won by the Bernard Tuner owned Lola T70 Mark III ahead of Leo Voyacides in another Lola. As for the past 24 hours Le Mans champions, Atwood and Chupin, they finished 10th in the evening race too. be settled in race three on Sunday morning. It went to Bernard Tuna in his Lola two seconds ahead of Antwood and Schuppen. Luco and Nicolet didn't take the start for race three, leaving Tuna to take the win ahead of the very consistent John Sheldon in the Chevron B16 and then Antwood and Schuppen. Stefan Gutzwiller in a second Chevron was next with the 69 Alpine A220 of Sylvain Stepak completing the top five. Oh, this is quite emotional. I raced four times at Le Mans in the 90s and I never actually finished the race. I've been participating in the Le Mans Classic since its inception. This was the first time I had luck on my side and the car ran like clockwork. I'm very pleased to be standing on the top step of the podium today. If there's one car synonymous with Le Mans, it's Ford's iconic GT40. 126 of these cars were built between 1964 and 68, and Ford won the June Classic four times between 66 and 69. If you need reminding, 40 stands for the height. That's 40 inches, 102 centimeters to be exact. It's also the star of one of the more impressive clubs, a mostly British contingent that wouldn't think of passing up a chance to be part of the weekend. Many years ago, I wanted to build a car, and I said to a neighbour, I'm going to build a Lotus. And he said, no, no, you've got to build a GT40. So I went off and read all the books and decided to build a GT40. You built a GT40 on your own hands? I built that one there. This one was built by you? Four years. Hard work, and every time it went wrong, I said to myself, why didn't I buy a Lotus? <laughs> I'm still pleased I've got it. I've had a lot of fun over the years. Wouldn't do it again. It was very hard work. Are you I enjoy driving it. Are you happy to be here with all the club? Uh, it's great. I mean, it's a great club. It's a very friendly club. Everybody's proud of their cars and uh, they're just nice people. The Le Mans Classic event is a biannual opportunity for these enthusiasts to get together and share the passion that's linked to this emblematic machine. The GT40 is an immortal car, it's a classic. We've had the chance every two years for these five editions to come here and be around the enthusiasts. There are 150 Mark I and IIs and another 12 or so new GT40s. I've had the chance to drive with them in bunches and when you're surrounded like this and part of it, it's incredible. I dreamt about this car, I watched it race and now I own one. At the Le Mans Classic we get the chance to see the real deal on the track and that's really something. 
Donc euh, voilà. Et puis là où en plus le moins classique, on les voit, on les, voit les, vrais, les vrais rouleurs, enfin les vrais, on, en principe c'est des vrais on va dire. Hein, euh, bon, euh, donc c'est voilà, c'est fabuleux quoi. For many experts and nostalgia buffs, the Ford GT40 and the battles it had with Ferrari symbolize Le Mans' most glorious period. The days when crowds at the French circuit were in the hundreds of thousands. Only the original GT40s took to the circuit during the 2010 Le Mans Classic. Day becomes night, but the action keeps on going. On the circuit is race two for the different groups, while fatigue begins to set in. The sensations are clearly unique for all the drivers, all of whom are having an evening to remember. Group 6 is reserved for the most recent cars dating from 1972 to 1979. Lola's Chevrons and Porsches and lap times were mightily impressive, with average speeds nearing the 200 km per hour mark on the over 13 km Le Mans long course. The MW was also well represented with some sublime M1s which were on display at the Art Car Expo, which is as symbolic of the Le Mans 24 hours as it is the German car maker. Group 6 also had its share of well-known drivers, including Henri Pescarolo in a 1976 in Altera, as well as historic racing standouts Paul Knapfield in a Ferrari 512 BBLM, Neil Primrose at the wheel of a Lola T290, Jean-Marc Luco and Jacques Nicolet were teamed in the stunning Porsche 936, Michel Quinu in a Lola T280 HUA, Dominique Leco in a Lola, and the president of Motors TV and F1 commentator on French radio, Jean-Luc Roy in a Lola T298. Jean-Marc Luco and Jacques Nicolet in the number 34 936 Porsche dominated Group 6, winning all three of their races, the only result worthy of this extraordinary example of engineering excellence.
Henri Pescarolo and teammate Gerard Quinet and Frederic Chambon finished 17th, 22nd and 17th to secure 9th place overall. Luco and Nicolet won going away, followed by Patrice Lafargue in Alola, Ludovic Caron in his Chevron, and current professional driver Sohail Ayari in a Ferrari. We came here looking for the double, perhaps we were a bit greedy. Destiny reminds us of the realities of motor racing, but would have liked to have won with the Ligier in Group 5 too. Honestly, a meeting such as this is extraordinary. When you're an enthusiast, you can't not be part of it. Nighttime at Le Mans creates its own special ambiance. The drivers perhaps push their limits as well as those of the cars. Caring for these obviously tiring machines is priority number one, but there are a few moments when one can take a break and leave the racetrack for the dance floor. The cool hours of night are the ideal time to pay a visit to the director of the race. Here he can keep an eye on the action thanks to the cameras positioned around the circuit. We have 33 cameras that work even at night. This allows us to see everything and react to safety needs. We can intervene to retrieve a car or in the case of a medical issue. Safety is another essential element of this fifth edition in which there wasn't a single major accident just a few mechanical woes due to the stifling heat. Early Sunday, July the 11th, a new day begins, and in one corner of the paddock a very 50s-like atmosphere is drawing quite a bit of attention. It's quite something to see fake gendarmes stopping passers-by to give them a curious bracelet. A pair of vintage handcuffs, a bit uncomfortable it looked like. Back on the track and a look at Group 1 featuring the oldest cars here this weekend, built between the years of 1923 and 1939. Among them is a replica of the car that won the very first 24 hours of Le Mans in 1923, the venerable Walker, entered by Jean-Paul Détroit. Worth noting are a group of Talbots that made the trip from England, Bentleys, Bugattis, Lagondad, MGs, BMWs, Delahays and Invictus.
Two-time Le Mans champion Jean-Pierre Jousseau drove this 1938 Simca 8, and there were entire families participating, such as the Du Boucheron in their Bentley, the Blakeney Edwards clan in an Invicta, the Nicolosis clan in a Bugatti, the Buglers in their Lagonda, the Frankels in another Bentley, and the Dieterins with their Alfa Romeo and Invicta. It had looked as if the number four Talbot 105 G052 of Gareth Burnett, Jason Bronson and Alex James would win overall after finishing first in race one and second in race two. But the French car never made it to the starting grid for race three, allowing the BMW 328 of Albert Otten, the winner of race two, along with two runner-up results, to take the win in group one. BMW was followed by two Talbots, the HRG 1500 of Didier Marty and Francois Legler and the Invicta of Rothenberger and Vautrin. While Group 1 is not the fastest, there is little doubt that these very vintage machines didn't have the easiest of times with the stifling heat. Just making it to the end for these participants was the main goal and their collective determination and best symbolises the spirit of the Le Mans Classic. We have a multifaceted approach and we do Le Mans Classic. Grand Prix de Pau History, Classic Endurance Racing, London to Brighton. They're all different, but I think, yes, you know, an event of this magnitude at Le Mans, an event which is very much achieving such a great stature in its own right, most definitely is a highlight. We'll now take a close look at the final group, Group 2, for cars built between 1949 and 1956, with a strong Jaguar presence but also many Porsches, the majority of which are 356s, and a number of prototypes such as Maserati's Triumphs and Austin Healy's, which all enjoyed Le Mans success in their day. Among the front runners are the 1955 D-type Jaguars of Monteverdi and Pearson, Antoni and Gavin Pickering, Pierre de Toisy in a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL, Marc Duez in a 1951 Renault 4 CV, and Dominique Lonlo in the 1953 Deutsch Bonnet. The suspense in Group 2 continued into the waning moments, and few had an easy time of it. With the help of Roger Earl, the Pickerings won Race 1 but finished a mere 26th in Race 2 and were a no-show for Race 3. Alex Buncombe in his Jaguar C-Type won Race 3 after finishing 2nd in Race 1, but he dropped all the way down to 57th in Race 2. Monteverdi and Pearson won Race 2, but came home 53rd in the opening race. Consistency is the key to success in endurance racing and was the deciding factor in Group 2. When all was said and done, the class winners were Neumark and Baxter in their Jaguar D-Type thanks to a 7th place and a pair of 3rd places. Nicola and Henri Chambon were next in a Maserati after they finished 3rd, 4th and 5th. Nigel Webb in his Jaguar was next, followed by John Clark, Chris Clark and David Smithies in a Cooper, and Pierre de Toisy and Robert Frowain in their Gullwing Mercedes-Benz.
When all was said and done, the spectacle both on the circuit and in the paddock and village was amazing. And the 2010 Le Mans Classic was an unabashed success. I feel fantastic. No, I can't tell you that. I just feel fantastic. Um, this is the fifth time I've raced my car at Le Mans. I've been second before, but to win here at Le Mans in that car doesn't get any better. The official prize giving followed for all the competitors who went the distance and their efforts deserve admiration and applause. Oh, it was a good addition. We've seen a significant increase in participation, a little more than 20%. These are good numbers during these difficult times. Are you satisfied with how the races went? Yeah, I'm satisfied. They were terrific races and we were lucky with the weather too. It was a little warm for the engines, but the race conditions for the drivers were safe. We didn't get any rain and that's always good when you put on an event like this. This was a breathtaking event. I saw it through the eyes of clients that came from all over the world, Japan, the US, Latin America and of course Europe. Usually when you invite people to this sort of thing, you hear things like, well, it was nice, thanks. But here, it's different. They say it's extravagant, stylish, unforgettable. Just fabulous with so much to take in, the sounds, the sights. We witnessed something truly spectacular. Drivers, owners, sponsors and spectators. Everyone knows that the next edition of the Le Mans Classic in 2012 will be just as unforgettable and will be just as much a must-do event as the fifth edition.